I want to welcome everyone to uh, today's session on the Yale Career, Career Panels, a candid view of entrepreneurism. Uh, my name is Peter Young. I'm the Yale class of uh, 74, Brantford, and I'm very pleased to, uh, to uh, welcome you to this eighth in a series of panel webinars on careers uh, after Yale. Uh, this particular series focuses on providing students and alumni with candid and, and hopefully helpful views of different professions via panels of successful practitioners in each field. Uh, today's profession is entrepreneurism, and as of this morning, we had 281 students and alumni registered for the event across the three venues. Now, I personally have a bit of special feeling about today's panel because I've been involved in a number of uh, new ventures throughout my career, starting from uh, starting uh, the Brantford Coffee House, which is a restaurant performance venue when I was a student at Yale, and, uh, and running all the way to starting Younger Partners, uh, an investment banking firm at Boutique serving life sciences and chemicals uh, at a time where boutiques weren't yet popular or considered to be uh, uh, viable. So why is there a need for this uh, kind of event? And to be honest with you, as smart and as resourceful as Yale uh, students are and graduates are, uh, it's very hard to get candid uh, and credible information about different professions. And as we know, uh, there's a lot of hype in mythology. Not about every profession, but a lot of professions. Uh, and uh, uh, particularly uh, some of the professions that are very popular amongst uh, Yale students and alumni. And a lot of it is perpetuated by TV shows and movies. After all, we all know that Dr. House and House uh, cures one or more patients in under an hour every week, or if you watch more than uh, once a week, uh, multiple times. Uh, we know that the lawyers in law and order rarely lose their cases, uh, not to mention they have this fabulous LED lighting in their offices, right? So uh, our hope is that this series of, of seminars uh, really will help you have balanced information. Uh, uh, not just the good, but also the ugly and, and, and the mythology, so that you can make intelligent uh, choices about your careers. Uh, now, we've, we started the first of these in the spring of 2011, and we've covered consulting, drama and film, the medical profession, the legal profession twice, and the investment banking profession twice. Uh, this particular panel will be the last one for this academic year, but we'll get started up again in the fall. Uh, attendance thus far has been exceptional, and the feedback we've received from students and alumni has been very positive. Uh, it, and it hasn't driven people necessarily away from professions, but rather uh, helped them figure out whether it's the right fit for them. Uh, now, the reason why we use three uh, venues is quite simple. Uh, we, we, uh, students tend to be here in New Haven. Uh, alumni tend to be either in New York or in a, anywhere around, uh, around the world. Uh, and uh, uh, so by having a meeting room in Yale and a meeting room in New York connected by video conferencing, uh, and then the rest by streaming video and audio conference, it really allows you to maximize the number of, uh, of attendees across the students and alumni. But also, quite frankly, panelists also have geographic preferences. Uh, today we have all of our panelists up here at Yale. We've had others where they refused to budge from New York. Uh, so, so that this helps to accommodate uh, that issue. So, uh, last uh, before I like uh, before I introduce the speakers, I'd like to thank a number of people and organizations. Uh, this has been a collaborative effort, a collaborative effort on the part of a number of organizations. First, I'd like to thank Elaine Mazzarella and the rest of the Yale Undergraduate Career Services staff, uh, Julia Zutko from the Yale School of Management. Uh, Steve Bloom and Elizabeth Rocher of AYA, uh, Trish Takemoto from the Association of Asian American Yale Alumni, who is in New York, by the way, uh, manning the, the fort there, uh, Maya Lu of the Yale Alumni Association of New York State, and the Junior Class Council, among others. All of these organizations have contributed to the planning and the most important and the very important marketing of the events to the various uh, student and alumni uh, groups. I also want to give special thanks to Paul Wise, uh, the law firm who has graciously provided the use of their meeting room in New York and their video conference equipment. Uh, I think any of you involved at all with the legal profession know that Paul Wise uh, is a firm of, uh, of more than 700 lawyers with a long-standing clients of both large public and private uh, companies. Uh, and 
Les Fagan is the partner uh, that we have been working with, who is also a young graduate. So for today's event, I would first uh, like to introduce the panelists, and then I'm going to guide them through the five topics that were outlined in the invitation that you all responded to. And then I'm going to open up the session to questions from the audience, uh, and hopefully we'll leave at least 10 uh, minutes at the end to do that. Now, for those of you who are in New here at Yale or in New York, you can ask a question just by raising your hand, and we'll uh, and their microphone so you can uh, you can uh, uh, ask your question. Uh, those of you who are uh, who are participating by the streaming video or the conference call, uh, you're muted for obvious reasons. Uh, so what we'd like you to do is to send your questions by email to YaleCareerPanels at gmail.com. And I have my iPad here, so I'll be able to see uh, your questions and uh, pose them to the uh, to the uh, to the panelists. We do expect to end promptly at 5:30 or thereabouts, but the panelists have graciously agreed to stay on to answer questions and meet with, uh, with the attendees. So first, uh, just let me uh, introduce the uh, uh, the, uh, the panelists. Uh, to my far right is uh, John Bittner, who is the CEO and founder of Splitwise. Uh, to his left is Michael Inwald, who is the founder and president of Cheese Boy, Grilled Cheese to Go. Uh, I sampled fair and it's very good. Uh, and uh, to his left, we have Chris McLeod, who is president CEO of uh, Axio Mix Inc., and also the retired president and CEO of 454 uh, Life Sciences, which is a very successful. Uh, biotech venture that ended up uh, sold to uh, a prominent uh, a pharma company. Uh, and uh, last but not least, we have uh, Jim Boyle, who is the director of the Yale Purdue Institute, which really uh, is doing wonderful things in terms of helping uh, students and alumni pursue entrepreneurial careers. So that's our group. And what I'd like to do to start off is really ask each one of my uh, panelists here to spend uh, a couple of minutes really just saying, how they got into this mess, right? And maybe we could just start from the right with John. Well, all right, um, hello everyone, I'm John. Uh, so I suppose I wasn't really intending to be an entrepreneur. Uh, I think that it's been really wonderful though. Uh, the way I got into it was I was in graduate school for physics. Uh, I was working on a project that uh, I wasn't very good at. And I had just, it was my third year of physics graduate school and I, uh, I just, one winter break, decided to start working on something that was sticking in my mind, which was uh, uh, what is the, how should roommates split rent fairly? It was like an interesting question that I thought about. Um, it wasn't, there wasn't an obvious answer, so I did a survey, uh, came up with an answer, put something on the internet, and uh, got a tremendous amount of press and response to it, which motivated me to, to start a company uh, around uh, the, survey, the survey I had made. Um, and uh, you know, I stayed in graduate school for a whole nother year, uh, the last six months of which I regret doing that. Um, but it was a very uh, tumultuous ride. I just totally found it by accident, but it's been, it's been great. My name is Michael Inwalt. I, I currently run a chain of uh, quick service restaurants that specialize in grilled cheese sandwiches and different types of melted sandwiches and soups and sides. Uh, we have eight restaurant locations with green developments across five states in the Northeast, uh, just to give you context of where we are today. Uh, my background has really been in entrepreneurship uh, since I was young. I grew up in a very entrepreneurial family. My mother was a successful uh, entrepreneur herself. She ran a test publishing company for psychological assessments. Uh, you know, starting when I was young, I was always playing around with different ideas. When I was in college, I started up kind of a somewhat of a nonprofit. Didn't really go very far, but I already had the inkling to get something off the ground, build a brand, uh, take an idea, and run with it. Uh, right after I graduated, I started a multimedia production company, uh, ran that for about two years, uh, dealt with all the challenges of being a bootstrapping entrepreneur, uh, trying to run a media business. Uh, right at that point, this is in 2003, 2004, video on the web was becoming hot. YouTube wasn't quite there yet. I don't know if uh, you guys remember it, sort of as it was getting really big. Um, I was trying to kind of get on top of that, but I had no access to capital. I didn't really know what I was doing. Uh, and so after two years, I called it quits. Uh, then started another company uh, called nightliferatings.com. Uh, Again, was kind of a project trying to get it off the ground, wanted to get it, you know, one of my businesses to be successful. Uh, and that didn't really go as planned. I didn't have the capital, I didn't have the marketing. 
um, kind of power that you need when you start up a web-based business. Uh, and then I kept on working on my next businesses and decided to come to Yale uh, School of Management. Uh, well, I was very lucky to uh, come here and meet Jim and get to know the Yale Entrepreneurial Institute. Uh, and I had this idea for a grilled cheese franchise concept for a number of years. That was kind of a passion of mine, uh, food and cheese and grilled cheese. And so finally, I was able to combine those passions together. <laughs> Somebody likes grilled cheese over there, right? Um, I was able to combine those passions, I was very lucky in that regard, and raise the capital I needed to get a proper business off the ground. Uh, and I've been doing that now for the last few years. Oh, I should make one comment, which is, I've heard about Michael's com company before I met him, because I know uh, one of his, ma his major investors, and they were just, they invested in biotech or whatever, but all he could talk about was this grilled cheese company, right, that he invested in. And I said, wow, that's, that's so exciting. And then I met at one of the Yale Entrepreneurial Institute events, I met Michael, and he said, I'm head of a grilled cheese company. He said, they can't be two. So it turned out to be the same one. <laughs> there, there are a few now. They, they, yeah, I am the same Michael. Yeah. Great. Uh, so my name is Chris McLeod, and when I was asked to be on the panel, I really questioned. I said, you know, I'm not what I would necessarily consider like Michael to be a professional entrepreneur. Uh, you know, my definition, I guess, or at least Schumpeter defined entrepreneurism as uh, innovators who use uh, disruptive practices to uh, change the status quo for products and services and introduce new products and services. And I think you can do that in a lot of ways. And, and like Michael, you know, I guess it started early for me. Um, I grew up in a family that had its own local tool shop, uh, family business. I had a paper route, you know, before I was even uh, in high school. And so you get a lot of those experiences of, of going out on your own and trying to, to earn a living. But I went on to graduate school, um, got a management degree, and have been in what I'll call more professional management. A lot of uh, innovative companies along the way, both in terms of consumer services, uh, life sciences, but only in the last year and a half after I retired from uh, 454 Life Sciences have I gotten involved with you know, really starting companies like Axiomics where you, you sign the incorporation papers or I'm an investor advisor on three other companies that are uh, locally in life sciences trying to you know, start from scratch. Yeah, and so you know, I'm now looking at it from, from a very different perspective. And uh, it'll be interesting as we go through some of the uh, questions, I think, to try to see, you know, say, you know, what are the common themes potentially? You know? But you hear about entrepreneurs like, a, like a Bill Gates or you know, even a Zuckerberg. And, and frankly, at this point, you know, I'd argue that they're no longer entrepreneurs. You know, in Gates' case, probably hasn't been for a long time. So, you know, we have to try to define, you know, what are some of the success factors. And if you're trying to make a career of it, you know, what is the profession? Um, hi, I'm Jim Boyle. I'm with the Yale Entrepreneurial Institute. And, and before I describe my background, I thought I'd uh, take a minute to, to do a little um, unpaid advertising here for YEI and tell you what it is, especially for those alums and um, others on the line who might not know what YEI is all about. So about six years ago, seven years ago, uh, Yale was faced with the embarrassing situation uh, that we were written up in the Wall Street Journal for not having an ecosystem that was capable of supporting student entrepreneurship. There were two groups of Yale students who tried to start ventures here in New Haven, and they tried to find money engineers, mentors, and they failed on all those counts. And they eventually gave up and went to Bay Area, whereupon they did uh, it. This came to light uh, here at Yale, that article. And we as a community asked ourselves the question. Uh, at the time, I was trying to get venture started with the faculty. I'll tell you my background in one minute. Um, what can we do to help students start their own ventures? So what began is really nothing more than a thought experiment in the summer of 2007, handpicking a small number of students and saying, do you have an idea that we can essentially assemble uh, a crash course in, on the new venture experience for them? That's turned, turned into a much larger effort where we literally have several hundred people, a small number of paid staff, but many dozens of mentors, of which these two gentlemen to my right participate, many, many people sitting on our boards, many more people who are students and faculty both who see themselves as innovators here on campus, we're creating a much larger instance of people who are trying to get ventures off the ground. And we have the full support of the university and the alumni community to do that. 
Um, ironic that they should ask uh, Jim Boyle to do that, because many years ago, in the early 90s, I was a PhD student here in chemical engineering. And my wife was a PhD student here, too. And she finished, she finished before me, she finished all after me, rather. And my professor, my mentor at the time, was an elderly gentleman by the name of John Fenn. And John had just invented, discovered something in the laboratory, very important, that would go on to become the basis of him winning the Nobel Prize. But John came to me and said, hey, listen, I think I have a technology here that really could be turned into something commercially. Would you help me do this out in, in the outside world after you, finish, after you get your degree? And I had no real firm game plan after finishing my PhD studies. I'm looking at John because you know we were both graduate students. And many graduate students find themselves not really having a firm game plan. I was one of those students. And uh, John came to me and said, you know, I'd like you to help me start this venture and get this technology off the ground, which went on to become uh, called Analytica. And it was based in nearby Brantford, Connecticut. And I spent 10 years there helping build these contraptions, these devices that were used for a, a technology called mass spectrometry, used for analyzing small molecules in the pharmaceutical industry, machines that companies like Chris's would use quite, quite, quite a few of. So it was a, a technology that really came ahead of Yale's creation of an office for commercializing these technologies. This was the late 80s and the early 90s. So we're kind of, you know, the gray hair on my head, kind of a dinosaur. We predate even the arrival of universities being interested in those kinds of technologies. So the message I wanted to leave all of you with today who were on this call thinking about innovation is we don't necessarily see ourselves as entrepreneurs when we take that step, we take that job, we take that position. We're there sometimes from sheer serendipity. And we have to, have to ask ourselves the question, well, can we be that lucky? And will we go through that door? And will we, will we be willing to be part of that experience and just see what happens? And I'll share more about that with you. Okay, so no, that's very, very helpful. And let's go on to, this, uh, to the first question. And what I'm going to do is really pose the question, but then uh, the panelists can decide which of you wants to answer it. Uh, so the first one is, you know, what are the myths versus the realities? And I think every profession has has this problem, some more severe than others, right? At least uh, entrepreneurism doesn't have five TV shows in prime time, other than I guess Shark Tank or something. So so that's not a source of, you know, misperception. Mis, uh, but what are some of the myths versus realities that are relevant to the people here who are thinking about, you know, being entrepreneurs? I can, uh, yeah, so I'm happy to start. Uh, you know, over the last, I'd say, 10 years or so, everyone in my life knew that I was kind of a set entrepreneur. That was my thing. I was looking to build a business and hopefully build one that I'm also passionate about. And I've learned that that's really the only uh, combination that works for entrepreneurs long, in the long run. Uh, but I've had the, the, the opportunity to meet lots of other fellow entrepreneurs or those who want to start companies uh, in the tech field, in, in biology, uh, in media, in, in every different type of environment. And I'd say one of the, it, it seems to be, I don't know what the myths are necessarily, but, but one myth is that uh, you know, in year two, you're gonna be making tons of money. <laughs> and I, I look at a lot of uh, you know, projected P&Ls, and um, to this day, uh, you know, MBA students all over the place still are, are presenting these P&Ls, and, and frankly, I uh, unfortunately have made the same error in projecting out what I think is gonna be the uh, short-term and long-term trajectory of my business businesses. Uh, the reality is that it, it often takes years before you can build a business uh, where you can develop the, the product, um, fine-tune it, develop a, a customer base that's large enough to actually monetize. So if you think, you know, year two or even year three, I'm going to be making all this money and I'm going to be getting a 200 times return on any investment, whether that's my investment or investment that comes from others, uh, it's probably a myth. That's the first one. Except for Instagram, right? I, you, know, you can be lucky. I, mean, that, I guess is another yeah. another myth that you can be on Instagram. There's one company called MillionPixels.com. I don't know if anyone remembers that. You know, in what in two months he sold a million pixels on one page to advertisers for a dollar each, made a million dollars. Uh, these are needles in a haystack. These are very rare events. The uh, Facebook story is you have a better chance of winning the lottery probably than having that experience, and that's probably one of the biggest myths that uh, you could debunk. Somehow. <laughs> Let me, let me just jump on that. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm a first-time entrepreneur, uh, and I'm certainly part of, uh, I've been caught up sort of in the excitement of entrepreneurship, and I think this time more than in 
in recent times I can remember, uh, certainly not when I was graduating, people weren't thinking about entrepreneurship as being such a cool thing. Uh, and it's really cool right now, it's like really hot, and, and maybe that's why I'm now a first time entrepreneur, so like, I don't know, but uh, yeah, I think that the, the Facebook story, the Instagram story, they get so much uh, play in the media because it's so fun to listen to such a uh, rags to riches story, and rags to riches stories have always been super awesome, and, and therefore, uh, entrepreneurship's myth is really about becoming rich, uh, which is I think probably a bad motivation for going into entrepreneurship. Uh, probably, uh, I don't know, maybe it's a good one, but I, I find it uh, really exciting to do for other reasons. I guess uh, another myth is that, yeah, sort of if you're interested in tech entrepreneurship and putting things out on the internet, uh, I think there's a lot of myth about thinking about an idea for a very long time without doing stuff. That's one entrepreneurship, that's one entrepreneurship myth that I think is slowly being debunked by um, much wiser people than me. Uh, there's been a lot of thought leadership recently about how, how important it is, especially if you're interested in doing something with technology, to test it as soon as possible and to try and make prototypes early. I think a lot of um, the people who are interested in entre entrepreneurship sort of really get into their idea and they spend a lot of time thinking about it um, without trying it out, uh, which I think is really dangerous. I was really lucky that I tried out my idea before I wanted to be an entrepreneur, but I think that it's, I see a lot of friends do it and it's scary. And I think uh, the sooner the better uh, for testing your idea in the wild, because who knows if it'll work. It's a lot of luck. Chris, do you have a comment? I think that's that, it's certainly good advice. Talk about maybe realities in a way too, which is you hear a lot about the need to raise capital, and you know we all say you know, the Haven's not a great place to start a business. You know, there's there's not a lot of capital available, uh, and, and certainly I'd like to hear some of your experiences. But you know, I do think the reality is if you're going to go out uh, and try to start a business, depending. You know, of course, on the industry, and, and in my sciences, the investment's often a lot larger than on the internet. Uh, but you know, you're going to realize you have to realize that you're going to have to spend a lot of time um, trying to get the investors to buy into your idea. So you know, yes, we all like to you know, work in the lab or work on uh, you know, on the computer. But the reality, I think, is that you're going to spend a lot of time uh, trying to get the capital you need to get to that that break-even point. As Mike pointed out, it, it, it's always a lot longer than you think uh, in coming. Uh, just to echo what, what you're hearing already, there's a superficiality to the treatment of web-based businesses online that I, um, I myself am mesmerized whenever I see the code.org video. I look at that and say, wow, those people are so cool. I wish I could have started Dropbox. But the way they portray young engineers sitting around designing code, they don't show all the people who are thinking about the strategy of how do we implement this, whether it's business to consumer or business to business. And to Chris's point, before you can get investors to buy, you have to have a strategy for you to get consumers to basically buy into this to get the unique impressions, or strategic partners to buy into it on the business side to have those partnerships. And that's a lot of hard work. And what we see all the time at YI, especially with students who are working with faculty, on big, complicated technical things. How do we get this product finished? How do we raise that first million dollars? How will we demonstrate the value of this technology to some potential acquirer or strategic partner? And there's a lot of hard work in that. It's not that easy. Yes, it's exciting that you can come in every morning and sort of you know drive your own train and call your own shots and do what you think and what your board of advisors thinks you should do, and no one's going to tell you what that is. But you only have so much time to get that right. You don't have an unlimited amount of time. So it requires a certain diligence and a certain resiliency on the part of the entrepreneurs to really be comfortable blazing a path where there is none. Yeah, and I do want to make one comment here because I've done a bunch of startups, started investment banks, started various things. And also, I was with uh, one of the old venture capital firms for a long time with you, venture capital. Firm. The one thing I would say is, Really, really ask yourself the premise for why the product or service is can uh, really exist and, and thrive. Because the reality is, startups are you're creating something where something doesn't exist, and trying to get that boulder rolling takes a huge amount of energy. But if you're pushing the wrong boulder, it's impossible. The other uh, thing, Benno Schmidt, who is the father of Benno Schmidt Jr., who is the president of the Yale for I was chairman of the case with me. His favorite saying, well, I thought was one. He said, there's only one thing better than learning from your mistakes, and that's learning from the mistakes of others. And I would highly recommend that, which is 
talk to a lot of people, talk to people who have experience who failed or succeeded, because guess what? Uh, you know, you're going to learn a lot. And, uh, you know, when I started Young Partners at Investment Bank, you know, I thought I knew everything. I brought some things. I talked to a bunch of folks, and boy, did I figure out that there's a whole lot about running an investment bank that has nothing to do with getting clients or revenues and so forth. So, uh, and, and it was painful, but I got through it, you know, thanks to a lot of advice from other people. Well, I'll just add one other thought, which is, and this is not nearly as, um, I don't want to say ominous, I want, I want to leave this question perhaps on a more positive note. If, if the four of us here were starting a venture, I think another really huge myth that we face all the time is we all want the same thing. We're, we're founders. We must all want the same thing, right? We all want to take the venture to the same place, with the same partners, build the same products and services, get off the choo-choo at the same time. That rarely happens. So, you know, one thing that I, I would advise, I think my colleagues would, would echo this, is you should have conversations with the rest of your team around where do you all want to go and how far do you want to go and how do you take that into account when you're building the plan. If I could just add one other kind of myth, uh, and this is also more of a positive, optimistic uh, element because it's, it's there's a lot of great things about entrepreneurship. Um, I want to say that probably one of the biggest myths I see is that in order to be an entrepreneur, in order to have a new company, you have to completely rewrite the rules. That you need to have a technology that's never existed before, you have to develop a patent. And frankly, I just don't think that that's true. Um, you know, I, we sell sandwiches, all right? <laughs> there have been companies out there that have sold sandwiches. And to, on your <laughs> maybe on, on, on a grilled cheese maker one day. Uh, but no, you know, everything that we do is commoditized. And uh, what we're focused on doing is just having better customer service, better ingredients, uh, having better branding and marketing. And we're in a very saturated uh, world, but there's still room for people to do it better. So it might be hard for you to build the next car, but Technically, if you have a great idea and you have the backing and the infrastructure and the skills, you could just build a better car, you could sell it better, and that, that's still an opportunity for entrepreneurship. So I want to make sure that people out there who are thinking about entrepreneurship think about, you know, that there is something to do inside the box that's not necessarily outside the box. I just want to second that, but I think probably dozens of people have tried to build almost the exact same company that splitwise is. I didn't really say in the beginning, we help people keep track of who they owe and why. So we're basically a bill splitter and tracker. You can keep IOUs tracked, that's what splitwise does. I think literally dozens of people have tried to build this company before, um, and that's totally cool. It's because it's, I think it's a great kind of obvious idea that a lot of people have had, and it sort of is about the way you execute and how and you know who you involve and, and what your strategy is, and there's a lot that can be done. but. Um, those are actually, that, that sort of saying that the idea is, myth, is mythologized in a way. And it's really not all about the idea, actually. It's really a lot about the execution of the idea. Now, my next question is as follows. Uh, what are the characteristics of people who tend to do well as entrepreneurs, and, but also who uh, tend to be happy? Now, by the way, I want to make sure everyone understands that uh, the two may or may not be the same. You can have people who are very good but miserable uh, at, at being an entrepreneur and so forth. Uh, so really, to what kind of skills or personality traits do you think tend to, you know, to, to be important to be a successful entrepreneur? But the other is, you know, what kind of people tend to be happy being entrepreneurs? Maybe, maybe uh, you, would you like to start? Sure, sure. <laughs> so um, I'm a fan of the, the uh, Pima Chodron is a Buddhist nun, and uh, she's written a book that I, I keep by my bedside called Comfortable with Uncertainty. And I, and I think to be an entrepreneur, you, you really do have to have sort of an innate uh, comfortableness with uncertainty and not knowing what things might go well, what things might not go well, what others think of your venture, what might happen to your team, what might happen in terms of the competitive space. And to a certain extent, I think you actually draw excitement from it. You actually look at that and say, there's a challenge there, there's a bit of an un uncharted territory feel to what we're doing. And I, and I think the people that we work with who are, who are doing things, whether they're outside the box or, as in Michael's case, inside the box, when he came in and said, we're going to build a company running a grilled cheese sandwich. And I was, I was a mass spectrometry guy, I built big expensive hardware in my day. And this guy, this young guy comes in and says, I'm going to build a grilled cheese sandwich. And I thought, this guy's insane. 
this is never going to work. You know, how can you get intellectual property on a grilled cheese sandwich? Mm -hmm. and, he, and then he explained to me, you don't need intellectual property. You need better ingredients and better cost of goods. And so, you know, and he was very comfortable being in a very crowded space because he thought he could differentiate himself from all the competitors through that feature set. And he has since proven all of us, proven himself correct that he can, in fact, do that. So back to your question about, you know, uh, the most important thing, I think, is just being comfortable with that That's my that's my. I'd like to come back a little bit in terms of, you know, each business I think will have a, a skill specific that you're going to need based on what it is. So it's interesting to hear you say that, you know, coming from life science where a lot of it does revolve around intellectual property to say, you know, I'm just going to be a better marketer or a better, op, you know, operating person. But I think what overrides anything when you get into going out on your own as an entrepreneur is you have to have that optimism, I'll call it. Because you're going to face setbacks and hurdles every day, and, and you're just going to get beat up. And if you don't have that it, it, you know, innate ability to come and see the positive you know, in that, and to say, you know, you know, this is good. I'm going to be building on this, and to be able to pick yourself up when you get knocked down, you know, you're not going to be successful, and, and you're not going to be happy. By the way, Chris, it, you. You, you would have been perfect with the drama and film career panel because that was one of the messages that they added uh, yeah. a couple weeks ago. And I was just going to sort of add, it's sort of like a lob ball here, but to see the positive, you have to be passionate. Because mm -hmm. there's no way you're going to think about all the great ways you're going to overcome this next challenge unless you care about the product or service or organization that you've founded. Uh, I, I think that perhaps my story is a, is a good example of that. Uh, I tried different types of companies. I, I was passionate about documentary filmmaking, not about creating corporate videos. And every day I'm creating these corporate videos for my media company and I'm thinking one day I'm going to be able to do documentary filmmaking. Um, but I was, I was kind of, you know, I had, I had challenges with cash flow. I didn't have any investment capital, so it was all sort of being recycled. Uh, and different issues, and I kind of just got fed up with it. I said, you know, I'm just not passionate enough about this. So I, I closed the company and I moved on. Uh, then I started the, the next company, which was a nightlife-related company, and I enjoyed going out. It was great. You know, I got into clubs for free as a guy. It's not very easy um, unless you have a bunch of women on your, on your you know, on your arms. Uh, so that was fun. It was great, but I wasn't passionate about providing nightlife advice to the rest of the world and developing a search engine online. That wasn't my passion. And so what happened? We came up against roadblocks. Did we push really hard to raise money? Did we push really hard to just keep on going? No, we gave up. I then tried to start up another company. I was thinking about what's the next opportunity? Maybe it's, it's, it's marketing in China. Uh, all this globalization happening. I had a marketing background while I was starting different companies. I worked uh, for various advertising agencies to pay the bills. Um, I figured, okay, I have a skill set here. Uh, there might be a market need to help uh, international companies penetrate the Chinese market, uh, especially with capitalism in its growth phase there. Uh, and then I got to the point where I started to do all sorts of interviews. I developed business cards. I had the website. I did a lot of work. I just realized I was not passionate about it, and so I just didn't continue pursuing it. Um, one thing about grilled cheese is that I'm not really selling grilled cheese, I just love hospitality, and I love food. And so my passion is to create these experiences where customers come to me and say, Michael, that was a, a fantastic meal, that was a great sandwich, I love Cheese Boy, this, this, this uh, tweets every day saying you know, how we're their favorite restaurant, and that feels really good because this is my life. And I get that satisfaction, and I have passion for it. Uh, I also have the capital to make this company uh, at least continue on its path for now. Um, so I'm, a, I'm very lucky in that regard. I will say that I, I met tons of entrepreneurs, whether it was at my MBA, my MBA program or before, that said, oh, I have an idea, I want to be rich, I want to make it work, and I'll tell you, none of them continued with their business. So you're going to waste a lot of time if you're not passionate about the idea and you're just not going to have that motivation to see the positive and to get over those hurdles that are inevitable in any startup. I agree with everything that's been said, and I, I love Splitwise. Splitwise is doing great right now. I'm not a successful entrepreneur yet, so I don't know what makes people successful. Uh, I think, uh, but I think it, I think these all sound like great uh, points. I would definitely say that um, a love of learning is really, really valuable. I think uh, learning is kind of sort of, and, and teaching to a certain degree can sort of be the the soul of entrepreneurship in that you, if you are an entrepreneur, you have to do everything right away or you need to have a team of people that can do everything and you're learning how to do um, all of the different things that uh, need, the company needs to have uh, as you go all the time and then trying to teach other people how to replicate the things that you've discovered. If you figured out a marketing channel that really, really works for you, 
and you're the one who's been running around uh, managing it, well, you know, as the company grows, eventually you're going to teach someone the insight and the market that you've learned about how to uh, go on and replicate and scale that marketing channel to having a team of five people who can make it even bigger. Um, so I'd say that from what I can see, if, if you're really just unwilling to learn a certain part of entre entrepreneurship, say legal, or you don't like regulations, or you don't like uh, raising capital, and you don't have someone on your team who wants to learn that, um, that will be a tremendous challenge. Uh, and I've seen that, that, that cause a lot of trouble for people, my friends. And I, and I would add this one characteristic, which is, and I just mentioned before, which is really, really pay attention to what's going around and be prepared to know that you're all fixed. And actually, there's a wonderful uh, article in the New York Times that was written about Instagram, for example, as an example. They were way off, and suddenly they realized their product was so they totally shifted. It wasn't supposed to be what their product was, but the wisdom was they figured out that what they originally were trying to build was totally off, and then nobody really wanted it, and they shifted. And I think the, the number of, 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 of startups where what they ended up doing, was it, if they're successful, was what they originally planned, it, it's, it's very interesting, but, but it's not always the case. Uh, the other is I just want to tell a brief story, Michael, about the passion for retail and food. You know, when I went to our business school, one guy who we desperately tried to keep stay in class and he would graduate, uh, all he would do is he would sit in front of, of, of delis and so forth and watch people go in and eat, right? And we were desperate because he was a great guy to get him to graduate, to go to class. And that guy was Ron Shade, who's who was founding of Alcon Pan and now Panera Bread. And he just, you know, you, you, you talked to him and all he talked about is service and food and whatever. And, uh, but, uh, but his success wasn't because of his MBA, I assure you. <laughs> yeah, I want to pick up on something Dave just said too, and you know, getting myth realities too. And certainly in, in a startup, you do wear many hats. But I think one of the key skills that um, you need to succeed in entrepreneurship um, in building a company is the ability to to hire, you know, judge people and to hire the right people and build the right team. And uh, it gets a little bit to what Jim said before, you gotta make sure you, you're aligned um, in terms of where you wanna go and that you bring on people that are, that are complementary. And, and I think it's that arc of being able to assemble the winning team that'll differentiate, you know, the successful uh, entrepreneurs from those that will fall in the Actually, I have a one related question for you, Jim, was, okay, there, there, are two, there are two camps. One camp says, well, the run of business requires experience, the startup requires even more experience, so why the hell should you get to a young person who's a student or, or whatever uh, ever get involved with because they're out of such a level. So the other camp that says, well, look at all these wonderful, successful startups started by young people who have energy and so forth, and yeah, they didn't have full amount of experience, but they had enthusiasm and passion, so they figured out and they managed to get some people to help them out. So, you know, would you like to elaborate? Because you see that all, all the time, right? Yeah. So I, mean, I think that if you have to look at the opportunity cost for a young person to start uh, an, an enterprise, eventually, be they undergraduates or graduate students, even, even young professionals. When you're early in your career, you aren't sacrificing that many things to start a company, especially if you're a student. You're being housed and fed. By, by the entity that here who's hosting you. You have some free time. When I was a college student, I, I liked to drink beer. That wasn't really the best use of my free time, <laughs> in hindsight. Uh, these days, uh, people come to YEI and they say, I'm thinking about a venture, I spend time talking to the mentors, the board members, the staff, and we think about you know, what could happen. And they're putting their time to work to think about, could they add value either to, for themselves, the economy, some kind of process or product that you want may have shared with them. So I think we're going to look back in 50 years' time and realize that before the advent of talking to students as potential entrepreneurs when they were still students, that we've wasted, that we were wasting all this capacity that young people had. And if it doesn't work out because they don't have the experience to be ultimately very successful when, they get, when the venture gets to a certain point, we have guys we can hire in when it gets to a certain point. So what we're thinking of is, can you get the company started? Can you get it through inception? Can you get through the seed stage? Can you get up to series A? Most of the ventures we have have taken young people, young people take it to a certain point. 
In a few cases, Michael Inwald, a small handful of others, they've, got, they've broken through that barrier and they've taken in large amounts of investment capital and become very successful. Maybe they're the outliers, but those things are, are, are possible even within entrepreneurs, sometimes. I was going to just sort of yeah, piggyback on that a little bit uh, on, on what both Jim and Chris said. Uh, one thing that I'm still learning every day, and it's hard, um, I consider myself to be a relatively confident person uh, in general. I think when I was younger, I had a little bit more arrogance. I didn't know that I was projecting that arrogance, but I, I do think being young and, and sort of being in, in the world that I was in, uh, I, I definitely had more of it. And as I'm getting older and as I'm getting more experience, I'm realizing how valuable humility is. Uh, it, it's something that when you start realizing that other people are better than you are at many different things and that you're willing to say, you know what, hey, I was wrong, uh, you know, and, and I'm definitely wrong plenty. Um, I like to think in general, for the most part, I am right and that I am steering the ship in the right direction. But I'll tell you, I rely very heavily on my team, to Chris's point. I've been very careful to try to find skill sets, people who have been in the restaurant industry for decades, to be able to help me guide this ship. And it's requiring that group effort. So, you know, I don't, I, I wouldn't say we were sort of looking at each other when we're talking about what does successful mean, and, and I, I don't think I'm there yet. I, I have a lot to, a lot of stripes to earn, so to speak. Uh, but the one thing that I, I am getting better at is being able to put that team together, be able to say that I'm, I'm wrong, to have that humility, uh, and that's helping me avoid some major pitfalls, and it's allowing me to make better decisions along the way. And so, if you have that that characteristic and that personality and a willingness to say, hey, maybe my idea isn't the best, let me hear the others and hear good ju uh, other judgments and other uh, justifications, um, you just might have a much better chance of being able to get past that first hump and manage a team. Because you're not going to be able to manage anybody and they're not going to want to work for you if you're telling them what to do every day and you don't recognize the intelligence amongst your peers. Let me flip the question the other way so uh, and say, what do you think are some of the characteristics of people that actually uh, prevent them from being successful, right? Uh, as as a, either a missing uh, element or an element that actually interferes. But also, uh, what, you know, of the people that you know who have been unhappy on this, can you see any pattern as to why they're you know, unhappy other than that they're right? Do you have a product <laughs> um, we, we have a certain fact base that we can talk about here in terms of uh, ventures that haven't succeeded. And it goes to John's point. And um, people have to be willing to learn. But in order to learn, people have to be coachable. And we talk uh, a great many hours, uh, all the mentors and advisors amongst ourselves, around so-and-so's coachability. Uh, brilliant man, brilliant woman. Are they coachable? Um, great at understanding the market space, but are they coachable? Um, fantastic with the other people on their team, but are they coachable? And if we don't, if we can't get past coachability, we there's a very high correlation between coachability, um, the lack of coachability, and failure, for sure. Because if you can't learn, as John was saying, then what Peter knows, what Michael knows, what John knows, what Chris knows, it's hard to break through your cranium to get that into your head. I, I guess, uh, just to sort of piggyback on that, like, um, because uh, you know, the world is a very crazy place, uh, we're all trying to figure out uh, ideas that will take hold and take root and will grow into beautiful businesses that we can uh, be really proud of and, and help lots of people. Uh, and some, it's just so hard to figure out exactly how to plug yourself in to the existing world and, and create some idea and then have it work and have people want to use it uh, and it's not to, not just be a vision, not just be a story. And, and so coachability is one way, being coachable is one way to get information about the world, to listen to wiser people than you who have failed before, who have, who have done what, successfully what you're trying to do uh, before in some way. Um, another, and, and sort of parallel to that is initiative because if you don't fail quickly at the things that you're trying to do, um, you won't. You, you can teach yourself from the wisdom of others, and you can teach yourself by failing in the market or succeeding. But fail is failing is almost as good. And if you fail fast enough, and you're coachable, and you're listening to all of the different opportunities around you, if you can find an opportunity that you're passionate about, you can't drift outside of your passion. But if you find some opportunity that you're passionate about that's slightly different than what you thought was the opportunity, um, uh, you know. 
it seems that from what all that I've read and all that I understand about entrepreneurship, that that is a great way to success. So being too single-minded and not and not having the initiative to, to learn what's not going to work because you just thought about it, and you didn't try it. Um, I think that's most businesses that I've seen, having been part of an accelerator, I mean, made a lot of friends. You know, either my age or at my stage, um, I, you know, Splitwise is still in the seed stage. We're not, we didn't crash through Series A. That's, I think, I'm hopefully going to bring through that that diversity in this panel. Um, not I crash, cruise through. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, that's, that's the phrase you were thinking of, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, I think I think that it's very important to stay nimble and to have the initiative. And, and if you if you're too focused, that can be bad. Let me just pick up on that uh, because. You know, I, I certainly agree with coachability, and we could pick out uh, characteristics that you know are the opposites of what we've already described. But I, I want to highlight one, which is where it's it's often um, what's needed to succeed, but you've got to also understand the flip side, and you can be careful about it. So Peter before mentioned flexibility, and you know certainly that's there, but in order to succeed, you also have to have a certain amount of stubbornness, and and because you're going to hit hurdles. And so you've got to believe in yourself, and you've got to believe that you're going down the right path, but you also got to know when to pivot. You, you got to know when to listen to that coach. And, and so you, you, you want to have both of these characteristics, or you know, a combination of them, uh, and I guess the art is, is to be able to say, okay, you know, this time you know, I'm going to stick to my guns, or you know, this time, hey, you know, I, I really need to, to change. I can sort of combine a couple things based on that. Uh, with, with my business, we have pivoted quite a bit, um, and we've made those shifts. Uh, when I first started the concept, it was really just a couple cheeses, uh, a couple different types of bread, and just a few toppings, and we thought that simplistic model was going to be the future. Um, and we learned very quickly that that wasn't the case, that we, need to have, we needed to have a slightly larger um, offering. We changed our name. Originally, it was called Grilled Cheese to Go. We rebranded it as Cheese Boy. So we had the, uh, at least, uh, the team uh, and the intelligence in the team to, to help steer us in a new direction and a willingness, I think, on all of our parts to make that change. But when we made the change, we did it aggressively. So each of the changes that we made, we pivoted, but we pivoted aggressively. So if we had a barrier in front of us, we looked at every resource. Uh, we were, you know, especially myself, I will stay up very late uh, at night trying to find a solution. And if there's a challenge in front of me, whether it has to do with HR, construction, <laughs> real estate, um, I won't rest until I figure out a solution and I sort of called up everyone that I know, hey, do you have any advice? Do you know what I can do? Uh, and I think that's sort of served me well uh, so far. And I, I think if you don't have that aggressiveness and that confidence and that stubbornness to just, hey, I need to solve this problem, you're probably going to be a little bit miserable because you're not going to get to that solution. And at the end of the day, you might not end up succeeding with whatever your goals are. And I think one thing that this panel cannot do for the, the students all night is for, for each person to be objective about themselves, and about what they're good at and not good at, but also uh, whether it's a match with their own personal interests and so forth. And uh, you know, if you uh, if you feel it's very important to live well and have a very nice income uh, in your current state. It's going to be very difficult to be uh, a successful entrepreneur because you're going to go through a long period where you know you, you can't have a big salary and so forth. So I think you know, and this panel can't address that issue because each of you has to think about it yourself and say, let me objectively try or help some get someone to help me be objective about what I'm really good at, not good at, but also what are my likes and dislikes, and I, out of that will come whether you really fit being an entrepreneur or not. And, uh, and, and that's very important. Now, uh, we've asked this question of all, all the different professions, and that is, where are things headed that may either make it better or worse? And so, for example, legal, they said, well, you know, the clients are being tougher on fees, uh, you know, there's an oversupply of lawyers, so forth. A drama and film, uh, a few weeks ago, they said, well, one of the problem is technology is totally disrupting the whole entertainment space. And so it's touching, you know, it, it, what, what's happening in newspapers is starting to happen, drama and streaming, streaming video, and, and so forth, and a, a lot of disruptive technologies. And so that's making it more difficult for traditional drama and film to make money. So what's the equivalent 
from the entrepreneurial space, which is that would affect uh, either make it either easier to be successful on a left or, or more difficult to be successful that's on a macro basis, structural basis. Any comment? Yeah, I had a question earlier. There, it, it, what the question I had is, is, is crowdsourcing going to make it easier uh, to get companies started? Or you know, will we have a backlash on some of that? Your opinion? Uh, what do you mean by crowdsourcing? Do you mean crowdfunding or crowdfunding? crowdfunding. Oh, yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah. Sorry that. Yeah, so, so the, the, um, I, I think it, it, for certain um, uh, opportunities, it, it's making it easier. Uh, okay, yeah, I mean, I think that there's just tremendous, tremendous change talking about if you're interested in doing biz uh, business to consumer, internet business, uh, I mean, things are changing every day, but I think the, the big trends are that, yeah, so crowdfunding and cheap technology, open source technology is causing uh, it to be easier than ever to start something. Uh, so there's more and more people trying it, and there's just tremendous competition for attention, um, not to mention that uh, Google and Facebook and you know Yahoo and Apple have sucked most of the oxygen out of any way to make money in consumer internet. So it's very challenging, uh, and I would definitely encourage people to think through uh, you know both how they're going to get distribution, how they're going to how are they going to find uh, a source of attention, uh, you know in a in a vast sea of people starting internet blogs, businesses, companies, uh, tweets, the whole the whole nine yards. Um, I think the access to capital, so I, I think crowdfunding will make it easier to start businesses, but it will also make every uh, business more competitive. I mean, every space will be more competitive uh, because at least at this, for a seed stage kind of idea. So um, that'd be my guess. I think it'll make it, it'll, there are already a lot of sources of capital other than venture capital and uh, angel funding and going to the bank. There, you can already get grants, there are competitions, there are, uh, Crazy, all kinds of crazy ways to look for capital, and this will be yet another crazy way to look for capital. Um, but I think that the real the, the real trend, it, and I would say this to anyone interested in being an, being an entrepreneur uh, in the technology space, is there are no engineers that are easy to get, that are cheap, that are good. Uh, you, being, um, being an entrepreneur in part is being able to do things, to, to start your company, to do the first few things that need to get done, to to get past that inception phase so that other people will believe and that you'll be able to recruit others to share your vision. And never has it been harder to find an engineer who shares your vision, is willing to work for no pay, and uh, who you can work with and are compatible with as a business partner. So don't take that for granted uh, if you're interested in internet businesses. Um, you, you should almost judge that if, if you're not an engineer yourself, and you could be a, a, you know, either a software engineer or whatever's the relevant kind of engineering to your business, it's a, it's a nationwide shortage. Uh, and you owe it to yourself to learn enough to, to get your business off the ground. Uh, I think that learning that would probably be one of your best uh, assets. And Jim, you you probably have an opinion here just because you you have a you see more you know more businesses in more areas, and you're involved with giving advice to people as to whether they should or should not pursue a particular right. you know kind of. Do you have any comments? Well, I think I think entrepreneurship is is vastly overhyped as a panacea for uh, the, the world economy the dearth of job creation and Fortune 500 and everyone says all the jobs are going to come, they'll be uh, derived organically from, from new ventures and, and then therefore everyone is supposed to go off and you know, take their idea and run with it and the internet is supposed to be the enabling technology the platform by which everyone can, can forward, they can advance their idea, crowdfund get their money and, and be wildly successful. I, I don't see that happening. I still think going back to the feature set, the behaviors, the characteristics of people. I think people do have to have good ideas. You do have to have a good founding team. You have to identify a problem worth solving. Where is there a need? Where does the market currently spend money and where it wants to spend less? Um, Josh Koppelman, who's a, a very well-known investor from First Round Capital, he came in some years ago and said, the world wants to spend less money on everything. It's not about making markets bigger but making markets smaller. How do you help the world contract what it spends on its problems and be happier about doing it? And that's the philosophy that we take out of YI. Do we have problems, can we identify problems big enough that they're worth solving, and can we recruit the teams to do that? And I, and I do think that while innovation is important, I do not see all 11,000 students at Yale becoming entrepreneurs. They don't all have the mindset to that, nor should they. I think it's really a conscious decision that everyone has to make. 
Now we have, uh, uh, it's now time to actually turn to questions so that we can uh, have enough time for questions but also end uh, uh, on time. So what I'd like to do is maybe first ask uh, whether uh, Trish uh, in, New, in New York can identify anyone who has a question uh, that they'd like to ask the panelists and have them speak into one of the microphones. Speak up a little bit. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes. okay, good. Hi, uh, my name is Jonathan. I'm a Yale alum, uh, class of 2010. I have a question for uh, for Michael. So I've, I'm in the restaurant industry now. I've been for a couple of years. And I also want to kind of go off in the food-related ventures. I was wondering, what are the merits to getting an MBA versus just going out and trying to open up your own? Sure, it's uh, a great question. Uh, kind of a little known fact amongst people who do know me, I did not come to Yale uh, School of Management to get my MBA. Uh, I actually came here to start my next venture. So, uh, and it's, it's probably not the most traditional route to launching a company, uh, but for me, I was living in New York City. I didn't really know, you know even though my mother was a uh, successful entrepreneur, uh, you know, my family, uh, there, there's no capital for me to start a venture. Um, that's not what, 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 what we kind of believe in. Um, and also, I didn't really have any friends or anybody else in my life who I knew who had capital. So uh, I struggled quite a bit. I had two businesses that both were viable, both actually, you know, still to this day could be successful, I think, uh, if it had the right capital infusion. So one, I wanted to meet investors. And I thought that getting, uh, becoming part of a network of, like-minded, entrepreneurial thinking, um, business savvy, uh, people might be helpful and I could get that perhaps in graduate school. Number two, I didn't have a background in finance and so I felt that uh, I had marketing, I had general entrepreneurial business experience, uh, but my finance skills were, were limited and so I wanted to take accounting, I wanted to take uh, financial statement analysis and I felt that I got a lot of that at Yale and many MBA programs are the same way so that I can actually read our P&Ls and not just read them but analyze them and understand how to uh, create better strategies and better projections. Uh, I would say that the MBA soft courses are probably not as helpful um, but there are some real uh, hard skills that you can learn in MBA and there's a lot of people who you'd be able to meet through an MBA program. So obviously in my situation uh, it's worked out. Uh, I wouldn't say that that means it's right for everybody. Uh, if that answers your question. Yes, thank you. Thank you. By the way, my, my personal view is that an MBA is only useful for certain things you want to do. You know, I think there, there's some professionals where if you don't have an A, you're not going to get into and there, and there are others for which it's an enormous waste of time. You know, and, I, and I got an MBA, but I did it for purpose. And, to go in a profession where you sort of have to have it, right? But if I wasn't interested in that profession, I, I, I probably shouldn't have done it, right? So I, I think it really depends upon what you're trying to do as to whether it uh, makes any sense. Um, I have a question here from Daniel uh, Rama Mukri. I'm so I apologize, I'm, I'm just going to, he says, hey panelists, as a Yale Calhoun College uh, 2008 graduate and now a full-time entrepreneur, I'm curious to know how universities and incubators and accelerators can better support and interact with each other. This may be actually a question for Jim. Um, to, to the extent that there are, that and this is kind of a, I'm sorry, this, this is a boring answer to the students in the room. Um, all the accelerators around the world do see themselves as part of a larger ecosystem, but we do see ourselves as having some role to fulfill, and at, at YEI here at Yale, we're trying to be, we see ourselves not really as an accelerator, we call ourselves a pre-accelerator. And the goal is every single fellow who comes out of the YI accelerator, as it's called, should go someplace and land more capital. We give them a lot of grant dollars, we want them to land in, in, with investors, be it in another accelerator or some other setting or with local investors and get their ventures off the ground. So we're not just about an ecosystem of people who know one another what I refer to as sort of the top of the funnel experience. YI is the bottom of the funnel. Where are the last stop you have at Yale before you graduate or leave with your venture is YI. And you exhaust 
to some other experience where there are more mentors, more investors, a better experience, and, and, and access to those markets. So that's how we see ourselves at YI. Do we have any questions here from any of the, uh, the students here at uh, GRFBL? Thank you so much for the uh, I have a question. Is it necessary to get some experience before you start being like your own business? Because there are cases that people start, like Mark, like he started as a student, but there are other people more successful after they get some experience. So I'm just wondering. Any questions? Go ahead. Yeah, I, so I started in school, uh, my, in, in graduate school, which is a bit different, and I had worked for one year. And I, but I, my co-founder, my first co-founder, Ryan Laughlin, maybe some of you know him, he was Yale 2012, um, started, and we worked our whole first year together through the end of his junior year and his entire senior year. And we joined an accelerator while he was a senior at Yale, and he came uh, four days out of five. He left Yale to come to the accelerator and work with us. And um, yeah, that was, it, I think doing, um, so I, I think that doing something that intense during school uh, is a sacrifice, and I wouldn't necessarily recommend it unless you feel compelled to, but I do, I think it really depends on the opportunity, and sort of be the, what I maybe should have said first. Um, I think that with a lot of, there's a lot, of, if you're trying to create um, a biomedical startup, there are people who have thought about this their whole life, who are very, very savvy and very thoughtful about the markets, and maybe experience would be helpful, maybe you have some insight, I think it kind of depends. Um, starting things on the internet right now, you know, Mark Zuckerberg, uh, you know, I don't know. I, I guess it depends. At some stage, probably you'll need people who have seen this sort of thing before, but it just depends on what market you're serving and what skills you need on your team, basically, I would say. Uh, in my perspective, uh, I certainly agree uh, in terms of when an opportunity presents itself and if you have just the core personality skill sets uh, to run with it, it doesn't really matter, I suppose, to, to a certain degree. But where experience really comes in, uh, it, it, two at least in, in my from my background, uh, the first is relevant experience for when you're trying to raise money. So I, in my kind of last ten years, I served as director of marketing of a large retail company that gave me uh, some good experience in retail. I worked for advertising agencies, some very large ones, so that gave me the marketing side. And so when I'm looking to raise money, I'm able to go to investors and say, uh, besides just the fact that I did start other companies so I had that mindset, I've actually worked in organizations, I've learned a lot from those organizations, and I have a bit of a resume. So that just makes it easier to raise money, but if you have a phenomenal idea, a patentable idea, obviously you might be able to get over that gap. But one uh, benefit as well to working that I learned is that you better understand how to work with other people and how to manage. Uh, I had the fortune of every single job that I had, I always had a team from the, the first job I had right out of college. Uh, and that allowed me to fine tune my ability to work with, with others. And I don't think that's an, always a natural inclination for a lot of people. Uh, you might be social, you might be outgoing, but that doesn't mean you know how to work in a team environment. And you, you can't get that without experience. Yeah, I don't really think it really depends on what you're trying to start up. So depending on what you're starting up, you may get more than enough experience, or you may be it may be a difficult situation where you're just not going to succeed. So I think it depends on what you're trying to uh, to start up, uh, and, you, and you may or may not have the relevant experience. But yeah, I think the other thing that Michael was saying is, uh, you know, there's you, there's no company that's for one person, right? And so uh, by definition, what you assemble as a team, if you have a deficiency in one area. You can make it up by having a CFO or a, or, a, or a marketing person who more than compensates for that. So I think first you have to look at what you're trying to start up and then look at yourself and say, honestly, do I have some really important skills to succeed there? But then almost certainly you won't have all the skills necessary for the company to be successful. So you have to say, how do I end up with a team that when you add everything together is going to be successful? And when I want to raise money, someone also may agree with it, right? Chris, do you have any comments? Well, no, I was just thinking about one of the myths that we didn't get to, which is that entrepreneurs are born and not made. And, uh, you know, I really think that you get, you have to accumulate experience. Now, you can, you can, by the time you're in college, have accumulated enough experiences in the relevant areas to be able to go out and succeed in a startup. But, uh, you know, I think that's a rarity. And I really think that um, 
it, it, you, it, there's probably at least 10 years worth of experience. You know, I don't know, it's 10,000 hours that they always talk about. Like, you, you need that. You need that certain amount of experience that you need to just get uh, out there in the field. So in the in the first year of uh, the first year of YAI, back in 2007, when we were going through this, uh, you know, very brash process of taking people with no experience and helping them start companies and. We were lucky enough, fortunate enough in that first summer to recruit uh, one of the founders of a very large internet media company that had just been purchased by Yahoo for $800 million. And this fellow comes in the room, all six foot six and jeans and a t-shirt, and we're thinking he's going to tell the story around. You want to be an entrepreneur? It's easy. Let's do it. Comes in the room, stands up, he goes, go be an entrepreneur? Can you give some advice? Go get a job. <laughs> totally ruins the whole vibe of the conversation. But I think, you know, echoing what we've heard here is that um, there's a happy medium. I, I think you do want to be exposed to the, 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 you know, the to and fro of being in a small startup venture and seeing what it's like to, cre to really create um, value and, and growth and all those things. But you can do it in a small enterprise, maybe one that's already started and where you're the, the fifth or 10th or 20th or 50th employee. So one of the things that I like to see all Yale students do, and for alums to support, is how do we help Yale students graduate and become employees of new ventures? Other people's new ventures, not necessarily your own. Why should you have to have your own idea to start a venture? There are only so many nuts like Michael Inbaugh to go around. We ought to be able to place you in, in settings where you can be employees of fairly new, fairly new ventures and where you can build those skill sets up. So in the fullness of time, that's one of the things that YI would like to see offered to Yale students of being able to work for existing ventures, perhaps that alums are, are, the, owner, are the owners of. I think we have time for one last question. Is there, is there any question from our New York crowd? Yeah, and Henry O3, uh, my question basically has to do with trust. Um, you know, at the beginning when you have to talk to investors and other people, how do you trust those people? Um, looking back at Facebook and Zuckerberg and Divya and the twins, you know, he contracted out those guys, or he, they contracted out Zuckerberg to help with their, you know, design work and then look what happened. So at the beginning, how do you trust people and how do you, you know, build that trust? Does anyone want to answer that? Yeah, I like that question a lot. Thank you for asking it. Uh, because that is kind of another, uh, and the first question is appropriate in the midst of entrepreneurship, that uh, everyone's going to steal your idea. And it might have happened in uh, Mark Zuckerberg's case, uh, and I'm sure it does happen. Uh, people are, are opportunistic all over. But uh, one thing that I learned very quickly, I, I tend to be very tight-lipped, and, and my instinct was not to tell anybody about my ideas. And the only result of that is that I just didn't meet enough people who would be able to help me. And so I ultimately, I think in the past, I've, I've shot myself in the foot because I've been overly careful and thinking that my idea is so great that someone else is going to steal it. Or, uh, and the reality is, is that you're probably more passionate about it than anyone you're talking to. Uh, if you're already at that stage where you're getting feedback from everybody, uh, it's probably, uh, probably unlikely that someone's just going to run off and steal it. Um, you do have to be careful if there are certain elements of your strategy that could easily be stolen. I, I'm not saying you should talk about everything with your venture, but when it comes to investors, uh, I think ultimately if you're raising money, you don't have a lot to lose at that stage. And so I, I guess my thought is that you read people. You can tell if someone's uh, a bit skeevy and say, hey, you're, you're acting weird. I'm not going to talk to you, and that's fine. Um, but overall, I, I would be more trusting if you're especially trying to get your business launched because the more you talk about it, the more people will give you feedback. And, and by being open, I've gotten tremendous feedback, and it's helped me in the direction uh, for my business. Can I just hop on there? I totally agree with everything uh, Michael just said. And I just wanted to add, there's sort of a different, there's two different aspects of trust. There's trust in investors you meet and, and mentors you meet uh, as you go you know, through trying to explain to people your idea, get them excited about it. And totally, uh, you know, if they're so excited about your idea, hopefully, if you made a good impression, they'll want to work with you, not go try it on their own and start from scratch. Um, but it's different with trusting uh, co-founders or partners, like more like the Mark Zuckerberg case, where you're actually really sort of getting uh, very involved with someone uh, to try and have them be your co-founder or uh, someone who's working right at the beginning, actually doing work. Um, and I do think that there's sort of almost a marriage-like aspect. I, personally, I think that 
uh, if really the, the strength of trust between business partners is incredibly important, and then it really helps to vet them uh, multiple ways, to know them for a while before you, you start business with them. Business with them. Um, and I, I mean, lack of trust between co-founders uh, destroys many, many uh, ventures. So I think that there's a different kind, there's trust in not having to, you should trust people not to steal your idea, but you should not necessarily always trust people to be great business partners, um, unless, you, unless you've, uh, you've developed that trust organically. So, uh, are there any other comments? If, if, if not, what I first want to do is I really want to thank the panelists who I think have done a terrific job. So please join me in thanking them. I think this, uh, uh, this hour has brought out lots of very interesting insights that I, I hope the students and all of my, uh, find very, very useful. And, uh, and of course, if, if you're a Yale student, if you don't go over to YEI, you're making a serious mistake because uh, it's a great resource and, uh, and you really need to be involved with them because they can be very helpful. So I want to thank everyone. I also want to thank everyone who's helped uh, put this program together and, uh, uh, and wish all of you who are going to be entrepreneurs a great deal of su success and happiness, right? Yes, I think it's cool. And uh, these, these, yeah. gentlemen, these gentlemen are going to stay behind for anyone here who wants to ask uh, any questions. And I want to thank all the people in New York who were part of this event. <laughs>